All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I'm your host with the most, the one and only. And lately, I've been asked a lot of questions surrounding the all new M2 MacBook Pros. If you didn't get the memo, less than a month ago, Apple released and updated the MacBook Pro line for both the 14 inch and 16 inch. It was essentially a spec bump style upgrade with mostly everything remaining the same other than the chipset and many users will inevitably wonder if they should upgrade or not. Well, we're gonna answer that question and more with some discrete benchmarks and some real world testing to see if there is actually a noticeable difference between the M1 Pro equipped MacBook Pro 14 inch, man, that's a mouthful, and the brand new M2 Pro equipped 14 inch MacBook Pro. Before we begin, if you're in the market for buying a brand new MacBook Pro, I'll drop my social media handles later on in the video, where you can tweet at me or shoot me a DM with help on configuring your specific MacBook so that it's tailored to your lifestyle and workload and so that you don't end up overpaying for something you simply don't need. Anyway, that's enough with the introductions. Let's roll that intro and get things started. <laughs> All right, fellow tech heads, chances are you've watched one of my other performance videos before in the past. I like to be real and authentic with you all and simply present my findings from my testing so you can come to a better conclusion for yourself. If you can, double check for me and make sure you're subscribed. If you're not, it'd mean a lot to me to have you as part of the fam. So all right, done with the shameless plug. Ladies and gentlemen, on screen right now are the technical specifications of each machine. They are more or less the same other than storage and of course the new M2 Pro chip versus the M1 Pro from the prior iteration. So first off, let's switch things up with a test I honestly forgot about while testing the new Mac Minis. But this test is called Speedometer 2.0. It's a test that analyzes typical performance when using web-based sites or applications. Think about Google Drive or those websites that constantly have new ads popping up here and there. Typically, the more RAM you have means you can open more tabs while not compromising performance, but realistically, most people don't open more than 10 plus tabs at a time and if you happen to do that seek help so anyway macbooks and mac os in general always provide a reliable web surfing experience but in terms of speedometer the new M2 Pro will provide more consistent and fluid performance while web surfing, coming in with a score of 411 versus 373 from the prior M1 Pro MacBook. So okay, pretty nice to know, but now let's head over to good old reliable Geekbench. As usual, we want to get a decent idea at the raw horsepower of each device, and Geekbench is usually a good start. So after running a simple single core and multi core test, the M2 Pro MacBook proves to be a worthy upgrade in terms of raw benchmarks. It comes in with a single core score of 2665, besting the single core score of 2397 from the original M1 Pro MacBook. On multi, the differences are actually quite surprising. They score pretty much the same within the margin of error of each other, with both models scoring in the low 12,000s. Interesting. Okay, let's remain on Geekbench now, running an OpenCL and Metal Test, both of which go deeper by also tapping into the GPU and gauging at its power combined. So across the board here, the M2 Pro MacBook scores consistently higher, with about a 3,000 point difference for OpenCL and about a 6,000 point difference for Metal. So initially, this led me to believe that graphics-wise, just like the M2 Mac Mini versus the M2 Pro Mac Mini, the M2 Pro chips expand greatly on graphical horsepower while providing modest improvements on other departments as we could see by the single and multi-core test. But okay, with any experiment, we can't come to conclusions with such little testing. So for assurance, I always like to run Cinebench because with MacBooks, this test immediately gets these guys into overdrive. They begin to get very hot and the fans start to crank up, signaling to the user that this test is pushing the chipset to their absolute limits. So here, can we expect similar results to Geekbench's test? Well, kind of. As you can see, on single core, the difference is only a little over 100 points, while the multi-core scores between the two isn't that large either, with less than a 100 point disparity. So based off these two tests, one can assume that most tasks your ordinary Apple shopper will perform will run nearly identical on both devices with maybe a slightly noticeable difference here and there. I'm talking about the users that only use MacBooks for Microsoft Word, maybe YouTube, maybe the occasional PowerPoint, stuff like that. 
It's only when you start to utilize your MacBook for more graphically intensive tasks that you should potentially consider the Pro or even Max variants of Apple Silicon. So anyway, we do need more testing. So now again, to shake things up slightly, we crank up a Unigen benchmarking app, but it's not heaven. This is called Valley. It's a similar test to Unigen's heaven test, but has more game-like scenes and mimics varying environments you would maybe encounter while playing your typical computer game. What I like about this test is it clearly indicates what the minimum and maximum FPS were throughout the test. Cause you know, some scenes are a little more intensive than others, but as you can see, we see some pretty modest improvements across the board with the max FPS being 173 versus 115 on the prior M1 Pro chip. That's not bad. Okay, staying with graphics and tests that simulate intensive scenes, let's head over to the GFX metal test only this time. We're going to run the offloaded test versus the non-offloaded tests. This is so that the GPU can run at its maximum potential without being constrained by a max refresh rate if having to display the testing on screen. It just makes the true potential of either device more apparent. I know on the screen right now you see the test running, but it was just for B-roll. It was offloaded during actual testing, I promise. And just as expected, the results satisfy my suspicion that the M2 Pro is more of a graphics leap forward since most of the scores come well above 10% better on average. Pretty interesting stuff, so in essence, gaming and tasks that require a GPU overload can be expected to perform smoother with less drop frames over time on average again. Okay, now for our final graphics test, we now pull up Blender version 3.4.0, which runs three offloaded simulated scenes and then spits out the samples per minute of each scene. The three tests are performed rather quickly, but then again, it is the M-style Apple chips we're talking about. Here once again, we do see improvements, but they're on the lighter side here with maybe about a three to four percent improvement in samples per minute pretty interesting i know so now let's head over into the real world testing you know i got both my videographers and photographers with these two tests so we'll start with a lightroom export test with 750 full resolution jpegs taken from my sony camera we copy the same settings and paste them to all and then export them to see how long it takes to do so and whether or not there's a worthwhile difference between the two. But sadly, the answer is more like the latter. The results here only show an 11 second improvement. I don't know if I'm that convinced. That's maybe a 5% improvement roughly, hardly enough to justify upgrading if you already have an existing M1 Pro equipped MacBook. So what about for videographers? Well, as usual, I perform identical edits, but this time with a slightly larger project coming in at about 12 minutes with a few more edits. This is usually the length of most of my projects for YouTube, so it feels accurate at least for my workload. Here, once again, only a few seconds faster with the M1 Pro Equip MacBook exporting the 12 minute project in six minutes and 56 seconds, while the newer M2 Pro Equipped version exported the same clip using the same exact compressor settings in 6 minutes and 38 seconds. Again, roughly around a 5% improvement. I mean, I personally wouldn't, especially if I'm only going to see an average of 5% improvement on time. It's simply not worth it, IMO. But okay, before we wrap up, I did want to discuss SSD speeds because it's not looking pretty for the M2 Pro MacBook. So okay, it's long been known that Apple discriminates against poor people who choose to get the base model storage because everyone knows MacBooks are by no means cheap. So look, check this out. The M1 Pro MacBook here has a one terabyte SSD, while the M2 Pro one has only 512 gigabytes. But you'd think something with the Pro moniker would lead to top of the line parts, right? Well, I don't know what's going on here, but the M1 Pro's disk speeds are significantly faster. The read speeds hover around 2,900 megs a second for the M2 Pro, but 5,200 on the M1 Pro. For write speeds, it's the same story. We see roughly 28 megabytes a second on the M2 Pro and a whopping 5,800 megabytes a second on the one terabyte M1 Pro. I really don't know if the one terabyte, two terabyte, and four terabyte options are simply using better parts, effectively making the cheaper storage options more cost-effective for Apple, but 
kind of messed up if this is actually the case. I'm not saying Apple is doing this, but based off this testing, the M2 Pro 512 gigabyte model specifically will lead to drastically lower transfer speeds. This is why I always recommend upgrading to at least one terabyte since that's usually the sweet spot for most professionals or users who utilize their MacBooks for school, work, or for hobby and for those that plan to have a MacBook for five, six, maybe seven years into the future. But all right, guys, that's about it. What are your thoughts? Clearly, I'm gonna always keep it real with you guys, and if you are coming from an M1 Pro model looking to upgrade, don't. Look, if you like burning money and have a fat bank account, by all means, run it, bro fam, but trust me, the performance gains are negligible. The more modest improvements come from the GPU related tasks. So unless you absolutely need that additional graphical horsepower, which is probably not the majority of people, then there is no need to upgrade in my humble opinion. Obviously, if you're looking to jump into your first ever Mac, then my goodness, this is a very easy recommend. Apple Silicon is literally years ahead of the competition. The only time I'd recommend upgrading is if you're coming from an Intel-based MacBook. Trust when I say this, it's night and day. But as promised, guys, here are my social media handles. Give me a follow. I like to post several polls to see you guys' collective opinions, plus channel news and updates. Tweet at me or DM me if you need some recommendations on which MacBook model is right for you. But yeah, guys, that's been it. I'm excited to hear what you all think about the differences in games between the M1 Pro chip and the M2 Pro down below. Clocking out for now. Remember to drink some water if you haven't already, and I can't wait to catch you all in my next video.